Our Bible word is 1 Corinthians 1 verses 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, and in brackets we preach Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So this is Paul is speaking or writing this letter to the Corinthians and to give background to this word a few weeks ago we did exactly the same textual unit where Paul contrasts the wisdom of men versus the so-called foolishness of God. So let's go to that video and we will see the full explain, explanation of the word there. So Apostle Paul is writing here to the congregation in Corinth. He established the congregation on his second missionary journey. He spent a time period there also of about 18 months to 24 months initially. And now at the time when he actually wrote this epistle, he was on his third missionary journey. And we can read about that in Acts 18 to 23. And so 1 Corinthians is dated roughly to somewhere between 53 to 55 AD. And there were various issues in the Corinthian congregation. Of course, it were mainly from a Gentile background and it was still a young Christian community just recently established. They must be socialized or trained into to the whole new Christian ethos and morality and way of thinking, but they were far from reaching that level yet. So Paul addresses various issues. Firstly, he received news from Chloe's people. And the news he received wasn't good. He heard that there were divisions. There was conflict between different groups there. There was also problems of sexual immorality that people still, they did not disengage themselves from it. Also, the Christians, they involved in lawsuits against each other, dragging each other to those courts that were available at the time. And also there were some who questioned Paul's authority. And we'll hear more about that when it comes to our Bible word. So that's the news he got from Chloe's people. And now there were also other issues that Paul addressed. And this is in a letter they actually wrote to him. And then in chapter 7 verses 1. So and the issues they wanted clarity for. Paul had to explain to them. And this included questions of virginity and marriage in chapter 7. Also food offered to idols, chapters 8 to 10. Can you eat meat that's offered to idols, yes or no? Then there's also problems that was, were experienced in worship. For example, the abuse of the Lord's Supper in chapter 11. Then also how to use spiritual gifts properly, which is discussed in verses Oh, chapters 12 to 14. And then in chapter 15, Paul there argues against those who deny the resurrection, that the body will again be raised from, from the dead. So Paul says, no, there is a resurrection of the body. And that's so, resurrection, that's the issue that Paul addresses in chapter 15. Now, initially, Paul speaks of this news he hears from Chloe's people. There are these divisions. And he says, some say they're from Apollos, some from Paul, some from Cephas, some, from, some support Christ. And Paul says, well, this is nonsense. Why are you doing this? And probably the root cause of also of these divisions is that the social elite in the congregation, there were probably only a few of them, because it sounds like most of the congregation in Corinth like Paul, say, Paul says, you're not from the well-born or whatever, you're mostly poor, etc. Probably many slaves also in the congregation in Corinth. But the, the few of the social elite, probably those who were well-educated, they opposed Paul. And for them, Paul, he wasn't really an eloquent speaker. Maybe not as good as Apollos. If you go read Acts 18 verses 14, it says that he was a very eloquent, eloquent man and very mighty in the scriptures. So for these guys, these Christians, Apollos was maybe a very good speaker. In the ancient world, a high form of education involved training in philosophy, like you would get exposure to Stoicism or Platonism or what other forms of philosophy at the time. And also 
rhetoric. And rhetoric, you, of course, learned how to write, how to compose letters, how to argue, how to debate, how to be in a court of law and put your case forward. So it's about eloquence in speech, etc. So philosophy and rhetoric, these were signs or that was typically the high education that existed back then. But that was only really available for the elite few. For 95% for plus of the population, that was far out of reach to learn how to read and write, etc. So, some of these in Corinth, they don't like Paul, they don't think he's a good speaker. So, before we come to our textual unit, our textual unit is chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, and that's where God's, or Paul speaks of God's foolishness and human wisdom. Before we come to this textual unit, Paul, of course, he addresses divisions and, and he says also that he's been sent to preach the gospel, really. And let's read what he says in verses 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So Paul is saying here, yeah, I bring you the gospel, I bring you the cross. And it's not just, for me, it's not about using eloquent words and to display high forms of learning. It's just to bring you the message of the cross. And now we come to our textual unit where it says, and also our word for the Sunday. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So Paul in this whole textual unit, he contrasts human wisdom, human education, human elite social status. He contrasts that with God's foolishness, which here is the preaching of the cross. For the wise of the world, for the educated of the world, preaching a crucified Messiah or a crucified Son of God would have just been ridiculous. We don't really appreciate today our preaching a crucified Messiah or Son of God in the ancient world would have been so offensive. It would have been obscene, so terrible. It's, it went contrary to everything that the people held dear. And, for example, for the Jewish people, a crucified Messiah, it went against everything they expected. A Messiah would come, he would be victorious. By all accounts, Jesus was a loser. He was nothing. He was humiliated and dishonored on the cross. He was defeated. He is nothing. Similarly for Gentiles, the idea of a son of God, especially that he's also Jewish, somewhere from a funny people that live on the edge of the empire, that only believe in one God, who are lazy because every seventh day they do nothing, these silly people who do not participate in the civic religion and festivals in honor of the emperor. These silly people, you want to say, from them comes the son of God or the a son of a God or the mediator of creation and he's crucified. You must be crazy. So we often, we don't appreciate just how rude and obnoxious and how offensive early Christians were to the fellow people around them for believing in this crucified Messiah and that he is a source of redemption, etc. And so it went all against all forms of wisdom. Now Paul belittles human wisdom. If we read in verse 19, he quotes from Isaiah 29 verse 14. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So for Paul, God destroys human wisdom and what human wisdom will see as acceptable. He also says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? He also refers here to Jewish scribes. In other words, those trained in the law. And they were probably priests. They were the interpreters of the law, these scribes. So they were also educated, etc. Where is the disputer of this age? In other words, the one who's trained in rhetoric who can speak eloquently, who can, make, who can argue and debate, etc. 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now Paul also explains here, by their own human wisdom, Paul, people didn't come to know God and His salvation. For them, this message of the cross is foolishness. So Paul is using kind of ironic language and paradoxes, etc. He speaks, well, God in His wisdom used foolishness to bring the message of the cross, etc. He says in verse 21, God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And he speaks that the Jews want a sign. The Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block. To the Greeks foolishness. But this, to, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So in other words, Elite status, educated status, eloquence, normally reserved for those in power, the powerful. No, Christ is the power. He's the genuine power. And Christ is the true wisdom. And this wisdom that comes from God. Hence what Paul says in verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. So Paul contrasts here. There's human wisdom. And human wisdom will normally see what God has done in Christ as foolishness. But Paul says, no, what? well, you don't want to know God by your human wisdom. But yes, God's true wisdom and power. It is brought and it's proclaimed to the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus. That is where true power is and where true wisdom is. So Paul, he takes human wisdom from its high throne he brings it to the bottom. Actually, he throws it away. And he says, God's wisdom is revealed by our preaching of the crucified Messiah. I would also advise you to go read chapters 2, 3, and 4, where Paul continues with this theme of comparing the wise and the foolish. Because Paul experienced very strong opposition from the elite in Corinth, supposedly the more educated and he, Paul refers to them as the wise. They are the wise ones. But he says, rather become foolish. Don't be so wise in your own knowledge. Because they also had a spiritual elitism about them. That they were already reigning. They were rich. They were, I mean, they were the best under the sun, so to think. So Paul speaks to them, be careful. Don't become too wise and, and in your own wisdom.